using a backhoe. So, all right, let's 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 dive in. This, this one's going to be interesting. It's going to be, I just realized I didn't bring my notes. So we'll see what happens. Um, as we throw them up on the screen, we'll probably, uh, I'll have to guess what my blank was. I have a pretty good idea what they were in every scenario, but we will see what happens. Here's what we're going to do. We're, we're only looking at one verse today, and any time you only study one verse of Scripture, you have a potential problem, uh, and this is always the case. So if you have a favorite verse, and most of us can quote, or at least partially quote John 3.16, many of us could quote elements of the Roman road. In fact, almost everyone in this crowd, anyway, would know Romans 3.23 if I said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the... And are, see, right? None of us know the second half of the same sentence. All right, we all know the first half of the sentence, but nobody knows that they're also freely justified in Christ who shed his blood. You know, like, we, we could keep going. It's a beautiful paragraph, and we see the context. In fact, the, the propitiation text is the all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God text. But anytime we study it, to, and, and probably the Classic example of us doing this would be John, I mean, John, uh, Philippians 4 13. Now, who knows that one right off the tongue? Philippians 4 13. I can do all things, I can win the football game through Christ who gives me strength, right? Except in that paragraph, the all things was poverty and being hungry, and I can do those things, I can suffer because Jesus gives me strength. So, anytime we hone in on one verse, there's a potential to misunderstand what the verse is talking about. That's because it's very important that we understand the context around that verse. So last week, you know, we had six whole verses about how wives should be subject to their husbands, and then we just get this one verse. Now, it's a meaty verse, one verse for what the husbands should be doing. Now, it starts with the word, look there in chapter 3, verse 7, likewise. That word is our key, exegetical tool. So if you think about when you study the Bible, there's, and, and I've used this word before, but you might not remember exactly what the word means. That is the right one. Excellent. I was so nervous it's going to be like last week's sermon or something like that, but we're good. All right, here we go. We're going to set up, and I'm going to use a big fancy term here, but you need to know this term if you're going to take the Bible and study it seriously. We're going to study exegetical parameters. I mean, I thought I'd get an amen or a woohoo on that one. All right, anyway. All right, X to Jesus. All right, X means out. Jesus is to lead. So you lead out from the text what the text said. The opposite would be to lead in to the text. So you make the text say what you want it to say. So I guarantee you could come up with any opinion on the planet on any topic, and you could Google it and find a Bible verse that supported it. Not actually but through eisegesis, where you, you just insert your own meaning, you nuance it the right way. You can make the Bible say almost anything you want it to say. We don't want to do that, though. What do we want the Bible to say? That's what, okay. We want, let me, okay, let me clarify, the sinful position would be, I want the Bible to say what I want it to say. The correct position, the proper position would be, we desire the Bible to say what the Bible is wanting to say? What does it say? What does it tell me? That's exegesis. And so when we read this, we, we want to lead out from the text the parameters, the structure, the framework, the boundaries, so to speak, of what the meaning of this text can be. The, it can't mean something that it didn't always mean. Where all of a sudden, hey, the Bible has new meaning it never had before. That doesn't make sense. It, it means what it's always meant, so we, we want to lead out that meaning. So we're going to follow two basic exegetical parameters. The fancy way of saying there's two governing principles that Peter is talking about through the entire flow of chapter um, two, half of two, all of three, and a good portion of four. He's got this one train of thought that's kind of got book insides, and we're going to follow this train of thought all the way through. And the verse we're reading today is right in the center of that train of thought. It's not some other idea. It's not he's talking about one thing, and then he changes the subject. He's coming right back into his main message when he says this one verse. It's not something out of the blue. So that, with that being clear, 
I think it's going to make sense what he's doing in this particular verse. So let's discuss what those two main talking points are that Peter is emphasizing as he's going through. To do that, let's just jump back to chapter 2 and let's look at verse 13. This was our original governing thought that will lead us through the rest of this section. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So here's this context. He's writing to a group of Christians who are suffering persecution in the church, and their temptation would undoubtedly be to rebel, to fight back, to to maybe separate, but they're supposed to be holy and separate in everyone's presence. They're supposed to be on display, and so they ask the question, how do we live in a world that is contrary to us? One of the primary ways we do that is we just bow down and take it. We submit. We are subject to every human institution. He starts off with the the one we probably like the least, and that is the government, whether the emperor as supreme or the governors who by him punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. We should submit to every human institution for the Lord's sake. We should submit. So his Submission is the main idea in the first section. So Peter is talking about how to submit to human institutions. Everything he says in this is about how we submit to human institutions. So submission is one of the governing words. So what should citizens do to their government? Submit. What should slaves do to their masters? All right, what should wives do to their husbands? What should husbands do to their wives? That one didn't feel nearly as confident. But yeah, this is how you submit. All of these are about how you submit. So last week, we encouraged wives to submit to their husbands. I am this week going to tell you how it is that husbands submit. It smells different, but it's the same thing. What's it look like? What's it going to be? That's what Peter's doing. That's what that likewise is. That's half of it. So he's talking about how to submit to human institutions, but he's also strongly emphasizing, do we still have to submit when that institution is broken and making bad decisions? Yes. Especially then is the point. Especially in that moment. What about slaves? That was his first clear example of that. When a slave, does a slave have to submit to an unjust evil, cruel master. Yes, it said, it said he does. Um, in fact, if you do that, you image Christ better than if you submitted to the master who is a good master. Because what has Jesus done? He has submitted to the greatest wickedness, greatest injustice of all of creation. He took upon him the sins of the world that he did not commit, offering himself in their place. So we image Christ as we suffer. So Peter's emphasizing submission in the context of injustice. Peter's emphasizing submission in the context of injustice. Now, remember, he did the same thing with wives. He told wives to submit to their own own husbands, even if they what? They disobey the word. Even if they are totally unfaithful to this book, they don't live by it, probably in this case don't care, aren't converted, aren't Christians, does a wife still have to submit to that husband? Yes, yes, that's what it's saying, that the submission itself is a suffering that glorifies the Lord. Now, is it telling husbands to be that husband? No, no, not at all. In fact, we're going to get the opposite of that take as we dive in to our one verse this morning. So let's go ahead and do that. We filled in the two blanks under exegetical parameters. So Peter is talking about how to submit to human institutions, and Peter is emphasizing submission in the context of injustice. Now, he's going to make a transition. There's a major shift in category between slaves and wives and then husbands. It's very different, and because of that, it dramatically alters his wording. I mean, how much did slaves get? That's like a whole paragraph. Wives get a whole paragraph, and then the men get this little sliver of information relative to everything else. That's because in a master-slave relationship, if the main thing you want to do is talk about submission, um, which party do you need to talk to? 
of the slave. If you're talking about a husband and wife relationship and the main topic is submission, which one are you going to talk about? The wife. Because that's the party in both of those scenarios that is going to be more likely in the submissive role, and not more likely, always in the submissive role. And so that's the one you're encouraging because we're talking about the context of submitting in a context of injustice. So who's more likely to experience injustice, the master or the slave? The slave. Who's more likely to experience injustice, the husband or the wife? The wife. She has a very different thing to say in these scenarios. Now, likewise, verse 7, let's talk about the husbands. So likewise, besides connecting to all of this tissue, all of these thoughts, all of this submission and injustice piece, it's emphasizing that likewise, men are supposed to submit. Now, to what? Men are commanded to submit to the institution of marriage. Men are commanded to submit to the institution of marriage. Now, we could do a whole sermon just on that statement. Men are commanded to submit to the institution of marriage. I mean, first and foremost, when you put a ring on a finger and you say, I'm going to marry you, I'm going to be faithful to you, right? Isn't that the whole purpose of this thing? That monogamy is the point? There's exclusivity in the marriage relationship in every category. You don't get to play this game with anyone else. Men are commanded to submit to the institution of marriage. So we're really going to define that as we go forward. So let's, let's read the whole verse and then come back and try to walk through this bit by bit. And we're going to get a little grammatical and super nerdy as we do so. So that's just how we are. We have to do that from time to time. So likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Are right, you hear that? There's several elements to this thing. He's, I'm going to give you the grammatical structure because in English it has been butchered. It's not set up like this at all in Greek. So we're going to I'm going to give it to you the way it would be in Greek. He's setting up his sentence and this is typical Greek language. Uh, we do think we do like bullet points, you know, three points in a sermon is our typical pattern in an you know, American setting. In their world, a sentence structure was built around more often a participle. Do you know what a participle is grammatically? Think ing word. An ing word. So, how should husbands be submitting? There's going to have a participle. Would think of an ad, a verbal adjective. Am I talking over your head there? Some of you have enough grammar experience. Do you know what an adjective is? An adjective describes a noun. A participle is a verb that is the adjective. So you're living in such a way. You're acting in such a way. So it's a verb describing the action. In this case, he's giving us Two participles that are going to define what he means by submission. Now, he didn't repeat the word submission in this text, though it is very clear that's the one it's describing because it's the likewise. Be subject in 13, uh, servants be subject in 18, wives likewise, wives be subject in verse 1, and now here's 7, likewise, husbands, this is how your subjection looks. You follow what I'm saying? So there's two participle phrases that define what it means to submit to this institution of marriage. All right, but you're going to see I have three points, even though I said there's two participles that make this construction. One is just a straightforward participle, and the second one is a compound. He tells you to do the same thing in two different ways. So we're going to have one basic one and then one complicated one that's really telling you two things. You add that together in English, that turns into a three-point sermon. Y'all with me so far? All right, that's all we're saying. So let me give you in the text what those pieces are. So if you look at verse 7, likewise husbands, it would be the way you submit is living with your wives in an understanding way. So living would be the first description of how you submit. So here this is kind of think of the word, um, have you ever, there used to be home ec classes 
Home Ec. You ever heard of that? What, what was Home Ec? Home economics, and it had nothing to do with the global economy. What was the home economic about? How to do domestic life. That's actually the Greek word here. Um, home, ep- home economic with your wife. That's what's going on here. Do that little domestic life thing with her in an understanding way. So that's the first participle. I haven't filled in a blank yet. I won't for a few minutes. I'm just giving you the structure of the passage. So step one, husbands, do the domestic thing with your br- domestic thing with your brain turned on. That was actually a big deal. Okay, do the domestic thing with your brain on. Second, the second participle is showing. Showing kind of means like apportioning. Uh, take, you got a, a, a section of something, and you take a piece off, and you designate it for a purpose. That's the word showing here. You portion it out. You, you cut up the pizza into eight squares. Portion off the appropriate, not, not squares, sorry. Triangles, they're not even triangles, though. What do you call it when it's a curve? A cone? A cone. It's a cone. We'll go with cone. All right, you, you cut the cone, the slices, and you should apportion an appropriate slice to two things, and that slice would be the word honor. So show honor, or apportion honor, in two particular ways. This is where it's dramatically different in the English text compared to how it is worded in the Greek text. So if you see there, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, it doesn't say since they are heirs with you. That's the second as. So show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, and as a co-heir of the grace of life. That would be the literal rendering of the text. So there's two ways you show honor in the actual wording in the Greek language here. You show honor to the woman, to your wife, as the weaker vessel, and second, as a co-heir. That's how it's worded. Not show, not show honor as a weaker vessel because she is a co-heir. That's a completely different construction. That is not what it says. You followed? So that's our pieces. So do the domestic life with your brain on. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, and then show honor to the woman as the co-heir. And then there's, it ends with a consequence, if you don't do this correctly, um, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So that's the pattern we're going to follow. So three points, but really four, because we're going to talk about the prayers at the end. So let's start. Very simple. How do husbands submit to the institution of marriage? The answer was living with your wives in an understanding way. The outline says, don't be an idiot. Okay, that's just because we used that expression last week in the sermon. You may remember the husbands, wives submit to your idios husband in the Greek, which is where we get our Greek word, I mean English word for idiot. Don't be stupid. Men, all right, let's just be, let's just be direct for a minute. Men, I mean, we're, we're so bad about this, it's like culturally a joke that men are stupid in marriage, right? I mean, we laugh at jokes on TV about that, right? It's not because your IQ is low, it's because you can get away with it. Right? There's a big difference between the two scenarios. Do not be dumb. We have a tendency to take our marriage, and I'm talking to the men here, and play dumb. A lot of times we, we don't know why our wife is angry. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. We absolutely. I'm sorry I'm busting your bubble right now. I'm giving your wife permission to disbelieve you when you say that. You know, you know that you didn't do X, Y, Z. There was something you let slip. You forgot to do something. And that's your question. It's just your way of saying, does she care or not? Ooh, she does. Okay. Don't be stupid, guys. All right, when you think about your marriage, first of all, think about it. Think. Think about your marriage. You don't treat the rest of your life the way you have a tendency to treat your marriage. What I'm saying is if you want to buy a new boat, I doubt you go to the boat store and just, hey, pick a boat. That's not what you're going to do. At least not very men that I have met. What you're going to do is you're going to Google boats. You're going to try out some boats. You're going to learn everything you can about boats. You're going to make the smartest decision about boats that you can, and then you come home, and you don't take any of that research power and treat it on your wife. You're not brainstorming how to take care of her. You're not 
using the mental energy you would on some trivial element of life to live with her. It says, live with your wife in an understanding way. There was an analogy, I think, in the might have been the fireproof movie. It was one of those Kendrick Brothers movies where I don't remember even which character now said it. It's like, you know, when you first get married, you have like a maybe a grade school education in your wife where your goal is to upgrade. You, you go from grade school education to high school and eventually you get a college degree and then you go back and you get a master's degree and you're not finished until you have like four doctorate degrees in your wife. You follow the logic here. You figure this out. Be smart. Learn what you're doing. Pay attention to what's going on in not just your world, but in hers. How do your actions impact her experience? You go out and you do this thing. You have fun. Does that impact what happens at home? Does that impact what she does with the kids? Does that impact any other layer of decision in your life? Think this through. Don't, don't be an idiot, guys. Live in an understanding way. This whole, we, we have excuses will say, oh, man, women are hard to understand. Now, that may be true. That is not a good excuse. We're going to stand before judgment one day. And guess which one of you in the husband-wife relationship is going to be held to greater accountability for the life that y'all had? Man, it's going to be you. It will be you. And do you think God's going to be satisfied with you saying, man, she was just complicated. I didn't understand all the time. He's going to say, why didn't you man up and do your job? I gave you a very simple task. You just didn't give it any effort. That will be the judgment. Guys, don't be that guy on judgment day. That's not a good excuse. We all know that's not a good excuse. Live with your wife in an understanding way. All right, second, this one is more nuanced, more complicated to work through, so let's dive in. This is where we're going to get politically incorrect. All right. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Remember, we're going to show honor in two ways. First, as the weaker vessel, and then second, as the co-heir. So we're going to show honor first as the weaker vessel. Now, remember our context. What is Peter primarily talking about? How you submit, particularly to injustice. Now, maybe with the issue of the government, men would relate to submitting to injustice. But the master does not relate to the slave in the same way. He doesn't understand what it's like to be beat by his master. He is the master offering the beating. The husband does not understand what it is like to be the wife in their culture. He is given a very different model for submission here. Paul does the same thing, but he does it for husbands, I mean for wives and husbands, and for the master, and he does it with a threat mentality, the exact sort of thing that Peter does in this scenario. And Paul, especially in Ephesians, when he tells the servants to submit to their masters, he also turns it on the masters and say, now masters, you treat them the same way because Jesus is not going to distinguish between you two when you get to heaven, and you're going to be held accountable to the same level that this servant is who's had to bear down and take it. He threatens the master with his obedience. Here's what I'm getting at here. Let's just dive into first weaker, weaker vessel. What is a weaker vessel? So I did a lot of reading on this one because I wanted to make sure I communicated this as clearly as possible. And vessel is interesting in the Greek language. This is the most generic possible word for object, a thing. So the word in English would be thing, not vessel. So thing, like when you don't give it a name, you don't give it any kind of description, it's just an object in the sentence, it's just the thing you're using, the thing you're, you're talking about, it's, it's a, this word, vessel. It's used to refer to basically anything you could possibly imagine, anything that could be quantifiable and designated as anything could receive this word. My point being, it's one of the most generic possible words in the language. So that both means it means nothing, and it does mean something a little bit, because when someone calls you a thing, how does that make you feel? Just an object. We say it a different way. Oh, I'm just a number at this job. What do we mean by that? 
Like I'm, I'm not treated with humanity. There's kind of a just object. I'm just treating object. I'm not a real person. So it is kind of that word. It is like that. In culture, in society, women are clearly the weaker vessel. Now, we could obviously walk through a lot of different things here and say men are stronger than women most of the time. But, I mean, I could, I'm sure I've met women that I wouldn't want to challenge, right? And, and men that plenty of women could destroy. So it's not saying that there's some universal principle that all men are weaker than all women. That's, that's not the point here. But culturally, that is the case. All right, we, we're not getting into the politics here. We're just getting into the biblical text. Two different conversations. So if someone accuses me of something afterwards, I'm going to be mad. We're just, we're just saying what this says. Culturally, women are the weaker vessel. This is just reality. Um, we could argue about why. That's not the point. Probably has to do with the general truth that men are stronger and women are weaker. That's probably the reality of having to do childbirth. It's probably also a variable in that conversation. But the reality is women experience injustice in a way men don't. This is just true. This is the world we have lived in for all of time. And the Bible is a beautiful picture of undoing that, of making wives co-heirs, making women equal in salvation in every possible sense. But it's recognizing here, men, you need to treat your wife the way Paul told the masters to treat their slaves. Like You need to watch out because in the end, you're not going to have this leg up. You're going to have a leg down, actually. You're going to be held to a greater accountability because you're now working with the weaker vessel. In other words, it's easier to sin against her than it is for her to sin against you. That's what we're saying here. She's the more likely object of injustice. So you need to be more cautious about how you treat her because you're more likely to be the one in sin than she is. So I know I've, I've heard many conversations about how, you know, if, if you just understood what my wife was like, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you show honor, and I, even using this word is dangerous in this scenario, you show honor as the privileged one between the two. You're going to be held to more accountability. You have more to give. You have more power. You have more control. You are the one who needs to act. So I don't care if your wife's not doing it right. I care if you are. The Bible cares if you are. You show honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. You are held to higher accountability. That's the point of that text. So honor your wife's position in life. Recognize the difficulty of her position in life. I will be honest, I have never once in my entire life wished I had Anna's job. It has never, ever occurred to me that I would rather do that part. Men were supposed to amen that. You're all like, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, you know what I'm saying. Let's, let's continue. So the second way we show honor is we show honor to our wives as a co heir, a co-inheritor, a co-participant of the grace of life. Co-participant. Who's more saved, you or your wife? Trick question. It's the same. We are co-heirs. Paul even uses the expression, there is neither male nor female in this covenant. Our relationship with the Lord is equal. It's not, it's not slightly different. It's exactly equal. You need to show honor to your wife as a co-heir. God doesn't love you more. Conversely, he doesn't love her more either. It's the same. You are co-heirs in life. There's so many, and this is one of the easiest ways to pick out false gospels in the, the early centuries. The Bible is radical in this view. Um, so much so that a lot of the early Gospels that were false Gospels had to alter the Bible's teaching here because this was too radical. So women couldn't inherit the same level of glory that a man could because that just wasn't right. In fact, in the Gospel of Thomas, 
um, which is from the pit of hell, just in case you're ever tempted to read from that book, um, women cannot go to heaven according to that gospel because they're inferior and God had to transform Mary into a man so that Mary could go. And if you read that and at all, you go like, oh, this kind of makes sense. What? <laughs> no! This is ridiculous. It is the opposite of what we are taught here. The exact opposite. Show honor to her as a co-heir. You get the same portion. Men do not inhabit a higher level of heaven when we get to heaven. None whatsoever. This goes back into that whole teaching about marriage. Um, in the Bible, how long does marriage last? Till death. Till death do us part. There's no need or use for human marriage in heaven. There will only be one marriage. What will that marriage be? It will be the marriage of the lamb to the bride. Who's the bride, just to be clear? It's all of us, collectively, this church. That's the marriage that will persist. And in that marriage, submission will be eternal. And who's doing the submission? The church to the husband. But this particular submission is temporary. That was our last point last week. The submission between a husband and a wife is temporary because we are co-heirs of the grace of life. All right, so look at the contrast here. It says, so treat them like the weaker vessel and treat them like they are co-heirs. If you read this wrong, that sounds contradictory. If you think the passage is telling you to ensure that your wife is the weaker vessel, you have completely misread the text. She already is, so you need to take special precaution because of that, because she is also your co-heir. If we say the text says you should make her the weaker vessel, then you've completely misread the text, because then we have a contradiction in the Scriptures. And this is in one flow of thought, Peter's saying both of these truths, not because they're contradictory, but because they are complementary. She is the one who's living as a weaker vessel. And you need to treat her with that in view because she's, in reality, a co-heir. You hear what he's saying? Now, let's listen to what happens if you don't do this. Men, this is interesting. If you do not do this, what's going to happen to your prayer life? It will be hindered. Let that sink in for just a second. Men. If you don't treat your wife correctly, Jesus will quit listening to your prayers. That's insane. That's crazy level intense. Jesus is saying, if you don't take care of her, I'm not going to take care of you. That is a pretty big condition. It's a pretty big threat. And then all these passages about, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength if I'm treating my wife right, otherwise he's going to leave me hanging. Ask and you will receive. Unless you're not honoring wife, then he's just going to let you knock and knock and knock and knock because he's not answering the door. This is a bold threat from the Lord. This isn't a, hey, you know, guys, you should be nice to your wives. It's convenient. You'll, you'll have a better marriage if you do. He could, he could come up with pragmatic arguments. That would have been really simple for Peter here. But these aren't pragmatic arguments. These are direct threats. This is like in the Old Testament when God gives a commandment, he ends it by saying, I am the Lord, which is his way of saying, don't cross me. And he just said that about men. How you treat your wife. Show her honor. Honor her position in life and honor her position in glory, or else you will face God's wrath. All right, let me pray. God, we thank you for today. We pray that you'd bless our reading of the word. I pray that this prove fruitful in our own hearts, our own lives, especially as men, as we lead our family and, and show honor. God, I pray that you would help us to mold and shape our thinking, our pattern of thought, our way of life to the Scriptures so that we could be faithful as the men in our homes. 
God, I pray that above all, you would receive glory and honor in the way we all live, the way we submit to one another, the way we live the gospel together as a community of Christ. I pray that you would bless. I pray that you would work in and through us for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Ted's going to come back up and uh, lead us.